We're going to go ahead and get started tonight, and we are in the Gospel of Mark, uh, chapters 11 through 16. And our scripture reader today is none other than Sister Frida. <laughs> Amen. All right. So, if you're, if you're able, we want to invite you to uh, stand for the reading of God's word. And Sister Peter, you can go ahead and, uh, and take us to the worship today. You got it, you bet? I thought it took like you to be uh, Mark 11. Mark 11, really? Yeah. Uh, no, I'm sorry, Mark 14. 14, that's right. 66 and 72. There you go. Mark 14, 66 and 72. All right. There you go. And Sister Frida is, is a, a preacher's kid. <laughs> Mark 14, verses 66 to 72. All right. Okay, Sister Peter, you ready? Okay. <laughs> While Peter was below in the courtyard, and of the servant girl of the high priest came by. When he saw Peter warm, warming himself, she looked closely at him. You also were with the Nazarene Jesus, mm -hmm. she said, but she denied it. But he denied it. I don't know or understand what you're talking about, he said, and went out into the entryway. When the servant girl saw him there, she said again to him, to, the, to those standing around, this fellow is one of them. Again, he denied it. After a little while, those standing there said to Peter, surely you are one of them. For you are a Gillian. Mm -hmm. He began to call down curses. All he swore to them. I don't know this man you're talking about. Immediately, the rooster crowed the second mm -hmm. time. And if he remembered the word Jesus had spoken to him. Mm -hmm. Before the rooster crowed twice, mm -hmm. you will disown me three times. Mm -hmm. And broke down and wept. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let's pray today, amen. Father, thank you for this opportunity to study the scriptures again together. We love coming together and the fellowship and just getting into the word and hearing what our scriptures are saying to us. If you look at the passion story of Jesus today, we ask. Uh, specifically, Lord, the, the, the Holy Spirit will speak to our hearts uh, concerning the great sacrifice that was made for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. <laughs> okay. Lots, lots to do with it. I know it's a lot because I've been preaching from this section of Scripture uh, for 30 something years, uh, trying to highlight the, the passion of the Lord, the death of the, of the cross, and the resurrection. Uh, of Jesus. But before we go there, let's go back to chapter 11 and start with the entry into Jerusalem. And we have read some of the other uh, passages about his uh, telling them he was going to go to Jerusalem and they were uh, hesitant to go. Uh, other uh, gospels will expand on that and tell you that if you go there, you know, you're going to probably be persecuted and die, which is what he was trying to tell them all along. Uh, but that, that was his, his goal, his purpose in life was to go to Jerusalem and for all this to happen. And so in chapter 11, it starts off there with the approach to Jerusalem. Uh, and the this time you get uh, a picture of Jesus going into and out of the city uh, for the next several chapters uh, throughout the days of the week leading into uh, the crucifixion. So if we start at the first verse, it says, When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethphage and Bethany, the of Mount of Olives, he sent two of the disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Just say this, The Lord needs it, and will send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door outside of the street. 
as they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, what are you doing? Untying the colt. They told them what Jesus had said, and they allowed them to take it. I'm going to stop right there. Uh, so one of the first thoughts that I had, and I, I'd, I'd like to start off, because some of y'all are, are usually still munching when we start off at the clock, uh, and that's the case tonight on Hoagie Night. Uh, but the prediction that Jesus said, you're going to go in there and you're going to find a colt. Uh, never been with them. So he makes these predictions and he tells the disciples to go and do this. So they're doing it kind of cold. And it, I don't think there's any difference in custom in terms of going to somebody else's neighborhood uh, and taking a cult or taking a car and saying, I'm, I'm, I'm going. And the Lord has to them if they stop you and ask them. Uh, so, how many of you would go into North Philly? And say, my pastor said I need to take this car. Right? That's one thing she would not do. That's what she's shaking me off on. All right? Yeah, right? And, and the, but the pastor has a deed of it. All right? That he's going to do it. Uh, so uh, it definitely is a step of faith to trust God at his word. When Jesus tells the disciples to do something, and they went ahead and did it. And it shows a, a faith in, in God. To do what he says, even though it seemed like something that was outside of their custom, out of their norm, right? Um, and the fact that he didn't explain it to them, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. so you, you don't get an explanation sometimes from the Lord. Uh, that's one of Gardner Taylor's uh, big points uh, about God and the Word of God is that the Bible is not a, a big why book. It, it, sometimes it asks the questions why but it never answers them. You know, why do the heathen rage? People imagine a main thing. No answer. It's, it's rhetorical. Yep, just a I was going to say also in the Old Testament when we see so many people questioning God when He tells them to do stuff, they they did. They just went along with it, which was I thought was actually a, a big show of faith because. Like, like Moses, Moses questioned a lot of things. <laughs> yeah, but I can't speak. But I can understand. Uh, Abraham did it. That's what God said. It was an encounter being for faith. Sarah laughed at it. Gideon said, well, let me put a piece out. Right? Uh, uh, he, yeah, uh, yeah, that's good. That's there. Um, yeah, you'll get an answer to it. That's right. Man. It's all 22. Uh, Job no explanation. Job questioned him. Yeah. Job questioned him. Uh, and then he also, at the same time, Job questioned him. Job's a lot like us. Yeah. He questions and then he declares, but I know my Redeemer lives. Right. And then in the right. last time, when it's all said and done, my Redeemer is going to be standing at the last day. We're going to be all right. The Lamentation said that. The Lamentation said that. These little situations are unique, of course. Uh, but questioning the Lord, some did it, some didn't, and the disciples did not. They went ahead and stepped out on faith and, and, and did what the Lord said to do. Uh, and then the fact that it comes true, there was a cult that was there. Uh, there was a, uh, what, there was it. So we know that he had a plan for what was to happen. He knew there was going to be a parade, so he had to have a cult. He knew what the scriptures said about a cult and the Messiah coming in on, on a cult. And he also knew that there would be praises being offered up. So he had all this in mind when he tells them to do it. Uh, and if, if we learn something from it, it may be that God knows a whole lot more about the situation than he's telling us. And we need to just trust that God knows better. Right? Uh, and, and a lot of parents have that. We don't always like to explain every little thing to the children, uh, but we like them to trust us when we tell them, uh, we're, we're going to go someplace, get in the car. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't want to answer all your 20 questions, uh, but let's go, right? And when I was older, I remember questioning my father, and then he wound up taking me next to the city dump. <laughs> the best little Mexican bowl in the world restaurant here. That's great. Uh, so yeah, so you learn to trust when he 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 proves himself, and that's one thing that came out in, in what should have come out is the trust in the Lord. Now we're gonna move right into the crucifixion stuff, and they're gonna wind up scattered and stuff like that. There's a lot of good stories that we're gonna, gonna, gonna hit on. 
But that was something that, that Jesus said, it, so I'm going to do it. And they did follow through with it. Right. Okay, let's move on. Uh, I'm going to go to um, the cursing of the fig tree. So go on with the first, the first 12. All right. On the following day, when they came from Bethany, he was hungry. These preachers, man, I'm telling you. <laughs> Seeing in the distance a fig, leaf, a fig tree in the leaf, he went to see whether perhaps he would find anything on it. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. He said to it, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. All right. Any thoughts about this? He sees a fig tree with a lot of leaves and goes to it looking for, expecting to find some food, some figs, and then there was none. And it's Mark says that it was not the season for figs. So he shouldn't have been expecting something. And then he's cursed it. May no one ever eat from you again. And his disciples heard it. <clears throat> yep, Reverend. Give me a reverend in the house. Go ahead. My um, aversion is to new people game version, but this particular Bible has some notes on that. And oh, good. I, I wondered about that myself. Um, yeah. So I was glad for, I am glad for the notes here. It said that um, Passover always comes in March or April, and fig season is not until May or June. However, fig trees generally produce a number of buds in March leaves in April and ripe fruit later on. Jesus was looking for the edible buds, the lack of which indicated that the tree would be fruitless that year. So there was a reason for him to expect something, mm -hmm. but there wasn't anything on it. No buds. No buds. Mm -hmm. Leaves, which I don't know, it's kind of makes me think that leaves were an indication that he should expect buds. Right. <laughs> well, they, the, the buds come before the leaves. So the, oh. the buds, then the leaves. Yeah. That's all I ever heard was that the fig tree leaves before the fruit. So that was confusing to me. If it had the leaves and no fruit, that would be the right thing. Yeah. But I didn't know that the buds come first. The buds, the leaves, the fruit, the right fruit. The buds are what give, what make the fruit. Yeah. yeah. So the leaves came first. That fig tree was and still is today a symbol of Israel. So uh, perhaps Jesus seeing the fig tree with no no fruit, but speaking of Israel that had no fruit, no fruit in the spiritual world, that he was going to face death. Have you preached on that before? No. I'm not good. Yeah, that's what I'm not saying. That's how the No use for it. It's gone. Yeah. That, that sounds uh, like that thought. Uh, that might be next uh, <laughs> next next fall <laughs> Sunday. Right? But yeah. that, that there was definitely that thought, and the gospel writers are doing it as well, trying to show uh, Jesus is the fulfillment of the messianic prophecies from Jew, Jewish tradition. But they were receiving him, so he then goes to the Gentiles. He goes to everybody, and then there's another thread that is that was a plan all along. That God God was intending when He called Abraham to use Abraham and his descendants as an example of what relationship with God is supposed to be like, so that the rest of the world could see it and and desire it. That's what the thought was. But Israel took it as no, we're the chosen, and nobody else is. That's what it devolved into anyway. And now Jesus is saying, "I'm coming here for fruit." From Israel, and there's no figs, there's no buds. You have not produced like you should have. And so there's going to be some trouble for you. And they were, for a people that was under occupied, you know, they were, their, their land was occupied by now the second, third generation of, of, of different empires conquering them. Persian media had occupied them there, and Greece occupied them there, and now Rome was occupying them. Uh, yet they still had this arrogance to them. <laughs> About the, the temple. As long as we got the temple, God's here, and you got to get yours. You know, we're gonna we're gonna beat you guys, whatever. At some point, they were looking for this leader that would overthrow Rome. And Jesus comes in with this prophecy about the figs later on. And you see, it probably in the next few verses, 
Um, there's the the idea that the, the temple is going to be torn down when he prophesies it. And it happens uh, probably about 40 years later, in 70 AD, the temple was torn down. And the Jewish people were then scattered uh, totally uh, from that. So their their expectation, their understanding of the covenant was misguided. They were, they were incorrect in what they thought the covenant was about. Uh, but Jesus was in. Is that talking about Abraham's covenant? Yeah. Yeah. They, they're they were covenant. very misguided. The covenant is by you shall all nations of the world be blessed. Yes. That the goal is that all of God's people would be blessed through God's people, Israel. Right? Uh, and I think they took it as it's just us. Yes. That's like it, just ignoring the scripture. Yeah. It's right in front of your face. Yeah. Uh, the blessing will be for the whole world. And when you talk about Abraham's seed, you're talking about Jesus. Yes. As the descendant of his seed. And yeah. then that how everybody would be blessed is because when Jesus comes, then the whole world will be blessed. Yes. And Paul explains that uh, later on in Galatians. He's like, really trying hard to explain it. And he's okay. doing a pretty good job of explaining it for a person who was very, very angry at the time. He was really upset. Uh, he calls them foolish Galatians. Yeah. He's, he's really angry with them. Uh, how quickly you were to depart from the teaching, you know. Uh, who did, who fooled you? You know, who led you astray? You were right, you know. Who hindered you? you know? Uh, but then he goes into it that if you are Christ, you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. And all, all coming out of that fig tree image of, as a representation of Israel. Uh, he's got other trees. It wasn't until recently I had actually ate some figs. Most of my life I had never had any. But when I finally had them, they're really good. Yeah, they're sweet. Yeah. Food now on our menu. That's right. Uh, let's I want to jump around that passage now to go to the 20th verse. Uh, I'm gonna read it out loud and then uh, I'm gonna ask Dickerson, uh, Reverend Dickerson, if he might jump in here. Uh, but in the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree withered away to its roots. Then Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. Jesus answered them, Have faith in God. Truly, I tell you, if you say to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, and if you do not doubt in your heart, but believe that what you say will come to pass, it will be done for you. So I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe what you, that you have received it, and it will be yours. So Jesus is, they're amazed that he said it about the tree, and then the next day it happened. Right? Uh, and then he wants to teach them, you got this too. Right. Uh, what do you got here? Oh, it's the same thing for us. And what, right, honestly, I was willing to see this for the first time, connecting the two. That he's demonstrating the very same thing he did to the to the fig tree. Mm -hmm. He he spoke with authority. He spoke with joy. It withered. It died. The disciples recognized it, made a big deal out of it, and then Jesus is giving them a lesson here that they do the same thing without doubting and giving their heart and. What they say should come to pass, they should have whatsoever they say. And of course, if two of my favorite verse uh, and my life verse, and every day, what am I dealing with? Mark 20, uh, 11 24. Therefore, what you, therefore, I say, I mean, what sort of things you should ask, what sort of things you desire when you pray? I'm just going to put King James Version. What sort of things you desire when you pray? Believe that you receive it, and you shall have it. And, and and if you're going to walk with the Lord and walk by faith and not by sight, this is the attitude, this is the mentality, this is the mindset that you need to have in your very own life when you're confronted with your mountain. Now, whether Jesus will talk about a literal mountain, all I know is I don't need no mountain that's literal to get out of my way because I don't be blocking you. What the mountain represents are our individual crises and things that we deal with. And Jesus is telling us to speak to it. If you want your situation to change, you're going to have to talk to it. Well, because if you don't talk to it, what's going to happen? It's going to continue to talk to you. And until you talk to it and tell it to get out of the way, with authority and faith, standing on the word of God, right? 
speaking the word of God to it, then the situation has to change. Now, is it going to change immediately? No, not necessarily, but you keep on speaking. You keep on talking to it, and eventually it has to go. And of course, you back it up in the name of Jesus because everything has to bow to his knee in the name of Jesus, right? So uh, here we have Jesus demonstrating how we are to walk by faith and not by sight, and then what to do when we're faced with our individual mountains, mm -hmm. crisis, situations. Mm -hmm. And guess what? As I say all the time, life gives us these opportunities every single day to practice this very verse of scripture, mm -hmm. as well as Mark 9, 23, all things are possible, right? right. We're, we're faced with that. It doesn't look like the mountain's going to move, but it's possible if you, if you believe it's possible. Uh, and if you don't believe but the impossibility to become possible, you're never going to see the impossibility become possible in your life because you don't believe for the impossibility to become possible, and therefore it can't be possible, and therefore it cannot move because you can't see it. Mm -hmm. The thought that you raised, I, I haven't considered, but uh, having just this uh, anxiety uh, uh, sermon series, uh, one of the things that happens to me, maybe to you too, I don't know. Uh, but the, when you can't sleep at night because you're worried about something or you're thinking about something, so that's allowing the mountain yes. Yes. to speak to you. Yes. 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 As opposed to yes. quoting the scripture and speaking to the mountain, yes. what the word of God said. And and when we pray, I know for me, when I pray, I, I don't remember a time, you know, when I've gotten up from prayer and without feeling better mm -hmm. about it, without feeling a lot more confidence. I, I just talk to God. Yeah. God's got this. God's going to handle it. So there's always a bit of calm. So yeah, speak to the mountain. Mm -hmm. you know, I share with uh, Pastor Dickerson about uh, Egypt. You know, when we were in Egypt, you remember that, Grandma? That story about the, the church in Cairo? Uh, so there's a big church in Cairo. Coptic church. You're with people on hang around there too, right? Uh, and they, they have these now Egyptologists. They tell a lot of fish stories. Uh, so you, you know, so take it for what it's worth. But so they, they tell us that they had read Mark's gospel about speaking to the mountain, the mountain being moved. And the people there wouldn't convert. And there were some civic leaders there. And they were authorized to shut down the church altogether. And so the church members were protesting it, of course. But the civic leader then said, if you can move this mountain here to the other side of town by, by tomorrow, then you can have your church. Right? Mm -hmm. The next day when they woke up, the mountain was moved to the other side of the hill. And they wound up carving uh, out of the mountain a, uh, a church sanctuary that they worshiped and they walked into it. Beautiful old place, uh, hewn out of, out of the rock and stuff like that. Uh, but that was the, the fulfillment of the scripture that they did. Well, yeah, speaking with confidence. Yeah, perhaps you can also tie in uh, James 4 7, where it says, Therefore, sweep yourself to the Lord, to God, to God, resist the devil, and he shall flee from you. Yeah. Well, we have a tendency just to read that at face value as resisting the devil, mm -hmm. meaning we're just resisting, we ignore him. What's resisting the devil and is not just ignore him, you got to speak to him. Because if you don't speak to him, he ain't moving. You can ignore him all you want, mm -hmm. and you can ignore your mountains. All you want, and you can ignore that, uh, as, as Pastor said, in your mind as you're trying to sleep, you can ignore the fact that the mountain is speaking to you while you're trying to go to sleep until you tell it to shut up, mm -hmm. get out of my way, leave me alone. I don't need to say it. Yeah. You're not going to get any peace about it. And the devil is sitting right there just looking at you because he you knows because you're not telling him to sleep. And he does tell us to speak to the situation, yeah. speak to it. Yeah. Right. It's going to continue. It's going to continue to speak to you. I highly recommend that when you're, when you're going through those worry nights to speak it. Yeah. Speak it. Read the scripture out loud. Because what will happen is you'll try to keep it in your mind. Maybe everybody's asleep around you. Your spouse will sleep next to you or what have you. And you're thinking, well, I don't want to speak it out loud and make people up. Uh, and then that will start to keep on winning. Speak it. Take it over. Uh, and then the psychologist will tell you that what happens when you speak something is you have to say it a few times over in your mind. When you write stuff down and speak stuff down, you have to think a few more times, five, six, seven times before you finish writing it down, what you're thinking about. And that also helps to push stuff out of your mind. So that's why they recommend journaling. Journaling what the word of God says. Not just journaling what you're worried about. Journal, write down what God's word says about it. 
and, and let that you know ruminate in your mind and take over your thought process, and then see if you can get some sleep. Mm -hmm. Right? That it, it really does relieve anxiety. It, and it really takes faith if you believe that when you speak to something, it's going to move. You know, I don't faith. It, it, it takes faith. I mean, confidence to, to, to speak to the situation. That, okay, I'm tired of going through this. I'm tired of this with my family. This situation is going to change. My finances are going to change. My marriage is going to be fixed. I'm going to be in the name of Jesus. You got to speak to it. And if you don't speak to it, then this is going to remain. Safe. Mm -hmm. Go back up now, back up to 15. Oh, one more thought? Yeah. So, with this whole story, so two things. One, um, I would encourage everyone to, if you're struggling with sleep and anxiety for sleep, um, read Psalm 4 8. Four, eight. It says, That's In right. peace, I will both lie down and sleep. For you, Lord, alone, Amen. make me dwell in safety and confident trust. Amen. Um, so, if you're struggling with sleep, struggling with anxiety, during sleep, Psalm four eight. Yep, and I told everybody this is new, um, the NIV version. Um, but if you're struggling with sleep, that is something I've struggled with anxiety and sleeping, and that is something I literally quote in my prayers every night. And I don't have as much anxiety and problems with sleeping. Um, but with this story in Mark, um, I see the fig tree as a mirror for us right people come to us jesus comes to us with an expectation he went to the tree with an expectation that there would be something there that he could use right that he could glean from and it's introspection for me because the question then becomes do people come to you with an expectation of being able to glean something from you but they're not able to because you're out of season right you're not in the correct cycle in which you're supposed to be operating. Yeah, I like that word expectation. So just as we're speaking to our challenges and speaking to our mountains, we also need to expect it to or expect the devil to leave you alone. You gotta have an expectation, that, you know, because you, you know Jesus has given us authority over closer, has given us a power and authority for his word, and therefore we can speak that authority to the mountain, to the devil. And but you gotta have an exo lacking expectation that it's going to it's got to because the word says so. I like that thought though about the we may not be in season or not, whatever that season we're in, we gotta be producing fruit. Yeah, we, we've got to be okay. ready for the for whoever we're back up with me to 15 and let's go to that cleansing of the temple story. Mm -hmm. Then they came to Jerusalem and he entered the temple and began to drive out those who were selling and those who were buying in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he wouldn't allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. He was teaching and saying, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations? But you have made it a den of robbers. And when the chief priests and the scribes heard it, they kept looking for a way to kill him. For they were afraid of him because the whole crowd was spellbound by the king. And when the evening came, Jesus and his disciples went out of the city, which is how he wanted to walk in across that big tree again. All right. Uh, so what do you what do you make of Jesus in the temple? Overturning the tables. Uh, some powerful stuff there. Bring order. Bring order to how was supposed to, how the temple was supposed to be operating. And they're out of order by selling whatever they were selling. Real and um, uh, and he's taking authority and, and uh, uses uh, uses authority that's been given to him. Yep. And setting things to straight. Yeah, he, he over he, he's got this zeal for the house of God. And it doesn't like the wrong stuffs going on in the house of God. So he comes in with this anger, right? Now just oppose that to this God is love, Jesus is love. The gospel is all about love. Christians should only talk about love. Now, how do you, how do you fix that? What's is this love? Yes. Yeah. Spoken like a true mom of a young girl. <laughs> That's right. You, you, you only clean house because you love the people and you want the and you love the Lord, right? We discipline. The scripture says it's, you discipline those you love. Just because you raise your bones, it ain't gonna be out of love. You just, you just, you just you set the way it's supposed to be. Yeah. 
Right. And I think I preached on that test about families too, which have the same kind of passion for our house. Uh, I preached at that uh, at that men's retreat that I went to as well. Uh, that we should have a passion for our own ones. That we should have that our houses be a house of prayer. Yeah. Um, that, that we won't tolerate junk in our house. Either, that we will insist on our house being a godly house. All right. So we did that. Um, let's let's move along. Uh, he goes into chapter 12. This is the next day uh, after that Palm Sunday parade. He's now teaching them in parables. Right? And in the 12th chapter, uh, he, the verse, first verse, he began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a pit for the wine press, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenants and went to another country. When the season came, he sent a slave to the tenants to collect from them his share of the produce of the vineyard. But they seized him and beat him and sent him away empty-handed. And again, he sent another slave to them. This one they beat over the head and insulted. Then he sent another, and that one they killed. And so it was with many others. Some they beat and others they killed. He had still one other, a beloved son. Finally, he sent him to them, saying, they will respect my son. Mm -hmm. But those tenants said to one another, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they seized him, killed him, and threw him out of the vineyard. What then will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the tenants and give the vineyard to others. Mm -hmm. Have you not read this scripture? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Mm -hmm. This was the Lord's doing, and it is amazing in our eyes. When they realized that he had told this parable against them, they wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowd. So they left and then went away. You got the interpretation to that? Everybody got that? What's, what's the interpretation of that parable? Go ahead. Who wants to share a little bit about it? I mean, he was talking about himself. Yeah. He He's the beloved son. About his son. Right. Who are these other guys? These other servants that got sent and got. The servants were the Pharisees and the No, no, no. Uh, the, the ones that they seized, they prophets. 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 Right. Uh, so and those who are seizing them, that scared of feeding, those who are seizing them are the Pharisees. And the Sadducees. Yes. So they, and this is what had become commonplace for any uh, person who claimed any kind of prophetic status mm -hmm. at that time. If they went to Jerusalem, the Pharisees and Sadducees would have their way with them, yeah. and they would be claimed uh, heretics, and they would be put to death. Yeah, everybody went up there. Right? Everybody again. And then you go back, of course, to the Old Testament prophets, and Jeremiah, um, they put him in, in, in lock. They, they locked him up for a little bit uh, because they didn't like his message. Mm -hmm. Right, uh, Elijah got chased around by uh, King Ahab and, and, and Queen uh, Jezebel. Uh, right, so the prophets have always had a, a hard time. Uh, what makes you wonder why everybody wants to be a preacher? You know? uh, but there, there's your thought that Jesus he laid it out for them, and he does so in a way that it doesn't take rocket science uh, to figure out he's talking about us. Right? And he's, he's even giving away the vineyard. So the covenant is going to others. Now the blessing, the inheritance is going to others. Now imagine Paul uh, read this or saw this or heard this from the Lord himself maybe and, and thought this is what it means, the inheritance that we get uh, because we're Abraham's seed uh, by faith. Uh, and yeah, so it, it shows, this is, in Mark's gospel, the reason they're so angry at him is because he's blaming them for the loss of the inheritance because they don't want to listen to what God's saying about uh, the promise to Abraham by you shall all nations of the world be blessed they had a, a real strong anti-Gentile uh, bias going on mm -hmm. and you know uh, to be fair uh, they came by it honestly the Gentiles had a really strong anti-Jewish bias uh, they had oppressed them for a hundred years already by the uh, so yeah it, it was a little war it was enmity it was it was rivalry uh, and for jesus to come in and say and do the things that he said and did it, it's it's understandable uh, that they would be kind of on on a little bit on edge that he's talking about us he's putting me on the other side of this sermon all right 
Uh, let's let's go to some other because so, so many good good stories here. Uh, go to the twenty eighth verse of chapter 20, chapter twelve. One of the scribes came near and heard them disputing with one another, and seeing that he answered them well, he asked him, "Which commandment is the first of all?" Jesus answered, "The first is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one." You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. <laughs> then the scribe said to him, you're right, teacher. <laughs> 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 it just doesn't make you laugh. It's something, you know, like... Let me give you a little star, teacher. Or something. Uh, you are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one, and besides him, there is no other and to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and all the strength, and to love one and neighbor as oneself. This is much more important than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared to ask him any question. Those two commandments, it, it had become developed. You know, they used to argue and write about everything. Uh, you know, they would break down the law and into all kinds of hundreds of laws uh, and this was one of the things that they came up with was those two commandments were the greatest. And it, that was a, a, a clear answer. So when Jesus answered, it wasn't a big thing. Uh, it was probably a big thing for this, this guy to try to think that, you know, he can give a stamp of approval. But because he did see it and then the way he finished it, more than, more important than all the burnt offerings and sacrifices. Because the burnt offerings and sacrifices was what made the Pharisees and Sadducees, the priests in Jerusalem, it made their, their status. It made their living. People had to come from far away and buy, you know, the, the animals and so forth, doves uh, at the temple, and these guys made money off of that. Uh, the taxes, temple taxes, all that stuff. They, they were getting wealthy off of the whole burnt offering and sacrifices. Well, so for someone from within the temple community to say what he said, yeah, he's not far. He, he's figured it out. That the commandments that God has given us is more important than these sacrifices. Mm -hmm. All right, I want to jump over to the forty-first verse. Uh, there's another uh, another a woman story where Jesus uh, highlights a woman uh, and puts her at the as the as the example. Uh, he sat down opposite the treasury and watched the crowd putting money into the treasury. Many rich people put in large sums. A poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which are worth a penny. Then he called his disciples and said to them, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all of those who are contributing to the treasury. For all of them have contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. Right? There'll be other, like Luke's gospel gives it even more uh, expounding on it. Uh, but, but Mark gives the gist of it that a woman puts in a little and is held up as percentage wise, she's the one really giving sacrificially giving because she put in everything she had to live with. So that was 100%. Mm. This is again one of my favorites. <laughs> it's my favorite. Everything you ever I know. <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't, and I'm I'm sitting here trying to figure out why it is one of my favorites. But like the way that she's honored, yeah, and and the fact that she's called a widow means that she's in a position that isn't honored. That he gives her that honor, and it doesn't. I think oftentimes when we talk about giving, there's this aroma of God will give back to you. And that's not present. It's just giving. It's just giving. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she's just giving. Yeah, that's sacrificial. Yeah, no. well, in those days, a woman who had no was a widow and didn't have any family was really in trouble. Yep. And perhaps that's why she had nothing else. Yeah. And yet, she still wants to give. She still wants to give. Yep. There she is, being obedient to the Lord. I was about to say, then if you look even deeper, look on my heart. Yeah. And that's what, that's what the Lord look at. Yeah. Even though she had no, she had nobody. But her heart, she still was willing to get. Yep. Yep. 
Yeah, there was one of the versions, uh, and I don't remember which one when I preached about it some while back, and I remember you liked that one too. Uh, something about uh, the sound, if you put your coin and threw it into the receptacle, right, it made a clanging sound. So the bigger the coin, the more money you had given, and the louder the sound it made. Uh, and so the will comes in and puts in two small copper coins mm -hmm. that barely make a, a, a bit, right? Yeah. You know? And that's the one that Jesus hears. So people look at outside stuff or listen for outside stuff, but God looking at the heart and the reality of the situation. God sees what you're doing. Mm -hmm. So even in your pain, widowhood, or poverty, widowhood, she's faithful and God sees it. God, God watches you. Right. And if God knows you're giving sacrificial, you gotta believe God's gonna take care of you. He's gonna bless you in some way, shape, and He knows what we're giving too, right? You know, we're still watching us and what we're not giving. Yeah, that's what I like. I think I preached years ago about that. That somebody's watching you. Yeah. And she's giving her little coins in the plate, but Jesus is watching. <laughs> Did you sing that song? Come on now, right? All right, let's go to uh, the next chapter. I want to I want to get over uh, to uh, let's jump all the way over to the 14th chapter. All right. The, the, this is the rich stuff. This is the, the, the cross and those kinds of things. So if we start at the, uh, well, let's start at verse one. It was two days before the Passover and the festival of Unleavened Bread. The chief priests and scribes were looking for a way to arrest Jesus by stealth and kill him. For well, they said, not during the festival, or there may be a riot among the people. And then while he's at Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at the table, a woman came with an alabaster jar, a very costly one, and another woman. So it's not just loose gospel. This is Jesus. Jesus does this. He's got women in the forefront so often. Uh, and she broke open the jar, poured the ointment on his head. But some were there who said to one another in anger, why was the ointment wasted in this way? Well, this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and the money given to the poor. And they scolded her. But Jesus said, let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has performed a good service for me. For you always have the poor with you, and you can show kindness to them whenever you wish. But you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for its burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever the good news is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in remembrance of her. Well, Jesus sure has made a big deal about what she did. Now the other gospels have different uh, a different woman. In John's gospel, it's Mary, who is the sister of Lazarus, who anoints Jesus after the resurrection of Lazarus. The very next chapter, uh, she anoints. So it's out of this gratitude. Uh, and then in, uh, there, there was one who said, uh, "What was it? If he knew what manner of woman she was." Yeah, no, it was, it was a cinnamon, mm -hmm. uh, uh, mighty loose gospel. Uh, and they, they were they were picking on her because she was a sinner. And they added that to the story and that, that part. Mm -hmm. um, but she, the, the basic point that Jesus says is you got to leave her alone. And I think the loose gospel, he adds the idea of I came into this house and you didn't wash my feet. And she hasn't stopped washing my feet. You didn't give me anything to dry my feet. She dries with her hair. Now she's really giving her all. You, you know, you're paling in comparison to this woman, and you want to call out her sins instead. Seven, uh, in Luke 7, that's the thing that I read you a good idea. I don't want to say. <laughs> yeah. Um, and of course, Jesus ties this into the crucifixion as well. And uh, when, he, when, he's not, when he dies, his body has to to be anointed uh, with, with this perfume to keep the smell down so that those who were dealing with the body could, could handle it uh, due to the stench. Uh, so he ties that into the body as well. His, his death is a prophetic action. Okay. Then the 10th verse. Then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the 12, 
went to the chief priests in order to betray him to them. All right? Uh, too much in there already. Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priest in order to betray him. He was intentional about his betrayal. It was not, I really didn't try to. That wasn't what I was intending to do. But he went there in order to betray him. And betray. You you can't betray somebody who's already your enemy. You can only betray somebody who you love. <laughs> That's betrayal. Otherwise, it's just trail. It was intentional. He wanted to do it. He went to them. They didn't come to him. Mm -hmm. um, they never set up anything. They just wanted to kill him. And it, you, we, I can imagine that they were in the room talking and he they say this guy Judas is outside. Yeah. One of the twelve. Let him in. What's he want to say? Yeah, so you got a plan. Yeah, the gospel and of course the devil sent him there. And that's what uh John's gospel I think is the one that says the devil entered into Judas. Yeah. yeah. I think that's either John or Luke. Um and, and and so you get more of this, oh, it's not my fault. The devil entered into me. Uh no, the, the, I think Mark's got it right. Uh, you allow the devil in you. You 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 can say no to the devil. You know you can tell the devil you know get me behind me. Say yeah. yeah. Uh, you can tell the devil you know yeah. to shut up. Uh, so if you yeah. don't, you allow the devil in. I had our prophet Judas like he accepted the prophet. He accepted like the just... Okay, your turn now. Go right. The devil's getting on the orders. And he was taking the orders. Uh, so he, uh, when they heard it, they were greatly pleased, promised to give him money, and he began to look for an opportunity to betray him. Yeah. And now he's definitely a double agent. He's working for the other side yeah. while he's hanging around Jesus. Yeah. Okay. Um, then the interesting story is there's a the Passover. On the first of verse 12, first day of 11 bread, when the Passover lamb was sacrificed, the disciples said to him, would he want us to go and make the preparations for you to eat the Passover? So he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him, and wherever he is, say to the owner of the house, the teacher asks, Where is my guest room where I might eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a, a large room upstairs, furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. My, what would take place in that upper room? You know, going all the way into the second chapter of Acts. Uh, the upper room becomes this great spot. Yes, Pastor. Just quickly jump in with the what happened at the Olympics. Hmm. What? With the uh with the upper room. The uh, 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 they had a controversy yeah. Yeah. where uh, oh, the, oh, the uh picture of Jesus with right. the oh, apostles oh, in the upper room ah. that they, they made a mockery of it yeah. transgender and uh, and um yeah. And all of the they they made an image of the the Lord's Supper, the Lord's, Lord's Supper, Lord's Supper. Lord's Supper. Lord's Supper. Lord's Supper. Lord's and she's painting. And it turned into a worldwide, worldwide disaster. Yes. Yes. They got criticized from every almost every Christian country. Yeah. Yeah. Um, right. Right. So. Everybody. Right. Huh? Yeah. And rightly so. And rightly so. But, but you know, why? You know why I say why? 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 That right thing that's up here. So they heard about it, okay? So what do you expect them to act? Mm -hmm. They yeah. are in the world, y'all. Yeah. 
they do not choose to follow the Lord. He told us they're not going to do it. So we can't get upset about something they don't want to do. So why get upset about it? Well, now we, our job is to choose. Well, you yeah. got upset about it when he took you over the table. He did. Well, well, why did he speak about it? But wait a minute. If you go back, the Lord is coming down to try to show us something. That's the Lord. Yeah. If you go back into that, uh, the 13th chapter, he's talking about persecution being put over. Mm -hmm. Right. He, he puts it out about what persecution that the world's not going to like. You. Right. God puts it out there. So right. yeah, uh, should we be uh, prepared for that? Yeah, we should be yes. respectful of that. That's yeah. you know, that's your point. That that's, that's going to happen. It's going to happen. That the world's not going to like us. Now, uh, the hypocrisy is probably more on the world side. And those of us who have friends who are in the world, academia in particular. Uh, I mean, the whole arguments and and. Uh, Apology, not apology, kind of stuff that's out there. That's a bunch of hypocritical stuff. They're just they know they're lying. They know what they did. They know why they were doing. That's right. So I'm don't saying. be saying that you didn't, you know, you didn't mean to do this. You didn't try to offend. You knew what they were doing. You know what you were doing. Can I say something? Can you yeah. can you all hear me? Okay. I thought what was really interesting. This is Minister Tracy. I thought what was really interesting with that. The, uh, that they didn't widely publicize, but they actually had a major power outage after that. And the only way you really got to see the news on that was through Twitter. Uh, there was a major power outage and the only there was like one one picture where the only place that had light was a church. So that was really and, and they were saying and a lot of people were like y'all better stop mocking god that was like that go. was trending on twitter so there i just wanted go. to point that that's out that's what i'm trying to say all right let's go back to I'm talking can about i add something to it's sister laverne um it was also on, also on instagram and instagram went a step further in providing some information that they at the beginning of the ceremony they did an interpretation of the lord's supper uh, using transgender um, individuals. Yeah, yeah, they definitely had a need. Now they they tried to explain it away as a Greek uh, festival thing too, which is not a better right, thing on people. Uh, the kind of orgies, I think with kids in there as well. Uh, so it, it really was not a good protection and a good good offering for the world to get better. If you want to say that, but we don't expect the world to know how to provide good answers. Uh, we expect ourselves as Christians to, to, to do it. And then the hard, the hard part is, those are people who are trying to run into the Lord. Yeah. They're trying to win the Lord. Yeah. And it, it is difficult. Because yeah. when, when they try to offend, it is easy to be offended. Yeah. They're trying to you know, insult me and mock me. Especially when God is living in you, it's easy to be that. Yeah. yeah, and then we still want to look beyond all of that. Yes, they're hypocritical. Yes, they're being mean. Yes, they're being hateful towards Christians. How do I reach it for Christ now? Right. So let's keep pushing that way. Don't don't allow ourselves to stay in the offended, vexed state. We've still got to find ways to win people to Christ. Right, right. and if you try to, don't misunderstand me. I'm sorry, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying these are out there. That's not what I'm saying, y'all. I'm saying don't get upset. We still have to love them. But I'm saying there's no need to get so, ah. Uh, I can't like believe it. I can't believe it. Right? Yeah, no, I can't right. believe it. I can't right. believe it because that is the word. Yeah. But we still have to love them. We still got to join them. That's what They're I'm doing. They're doing so many things in like schools and other things. Yeah, that's the goal. You know, and, uh, yeah. Uh, Reverend Morris got a, a, a brace up. A yeah. hand up. There we go. So, so I, I just want to get your perspective on um, should we say something? I think one of the comments was so we shouldn't say anything. We don't have to say anything. What's your, your comment on no, that? No, I think that's, that's an offensive thing that they did. I think you go ahead and say that. Yeah. It's an offensive thing that you did. Uh, I just don't want us to lose our composure and our, our focus. Right. It doesn't feel like One of the things that I saw, what, one of the things that struck me was when I saw it, I couldn't relate it that it was the Lord's Supper. Yeah, me neither. But other people, you didn't. Other, I, didn't. I couldn't see it. I'm like, how did they know? Yeah. How did they know it was representing the Lord's Supper? Well, I saw, but they, they I it people pinned it. That, that, they, people knew it and wrote in. Huh? 
It was enough of it. Like when I looked at, I didn't see it until the news. I'm not watching the Olympics. Mm -hmm. But when they, this is the guy reclined on the table, the people behind uh, the table in front. You could, I mean, yeah, you you see it, you know, all the pictures. It's not, it's not what we think of. They were reclined at the table, right? That's how uh, Judas was able to lean on Jesus, or John did lean on Jesus' bosom, I think, and, you know, and all that. So in the pictures that grandma have in the living room of Christ and all of them sitting at a big table, you know, with chairs like we are, uh, that's their picture. They, there's people standing behind the table. There's this guy that was, they said, was half, almost nude, but had a body paint, you know, body paint. Uh, and then I think flowers over his genitalia or something like that. There was enough of, that. Was, that's a long story short, there was enough of a similarity. I get you, yeah. but I'm just saying, if I would have saw that without anybody telling me, like right. me, I would have never, yeah, related it, yes. but evidently, yeah. so many people were in tune to that and caught it from all over the world. I'm saying, I, 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 I didn't at first. I had to see it again. I, I still, I have to see it again. Oh yeah, it's losing. Yeah, okay. Because I get a lot of stuff. So I would. I would challenge everyone, right? Like generationally, I'm considered a millennial, right? I'm the bridge between <laughs> technology, right? I've lived with the internet and without the internet, right? <laughs> All the things. So thinking about it as a millennial Christian, I think about it this way, and I think this is some of what MIT Shonda is getting at, is oftentimes as a church, and this is worldwide Christians, we tend to have selective outreach. We will be outraged and speak out over this <laughs> offensive depiction of the Lord's Supper, but we won't speak out about things that are happening right in our own backyard, right, right. in our neighborhood, all that kind of stuff, right? So I think that if we're going to speak up and say something about this on a international level, right, we also have to look at our own backyards and you have to then speak up on those out those outlandish, outrageous things that we're seeing there as well. That's mm -hmm. the only way that it works. And that is part of the reason why my generation and subsequent generations walk away from the church mm -hmm. is because we have a selective outrage. Mm -hmm. And that's there that's not consistent. All right, we're free. So I got another comment really quickly before. Um, no, 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 my, I'm sorry. Um, my, I would love for you guys to hear my son's version of what happened. Okay, go ahead. So the only point that I want to make in the midst of all of this is that yes, I agree that we should be outraged, and yes, I agree that. We should have um, a, a more um, uh, um, like an umbrella of outrage over sinful acts and so forth. And yes, I agree that we need to reach out to these folks in love. What I'm saying is that that's hard. It is. And I, what I'm saying is that I don't think as a society we are ready to hear, I don't like what you did, but I love you. Mm -hmm. I don't think that that message is received. And I don't know if we know how to how to give that message to her. Just the bird. She left. Yeah. That's a good one. Okay. All right. Um, is that enough? Uh, see when the French get involved, all okay. kinds <laughs> Watch out for French. I'm I'm looking at the picture now as a comparison, and it don't even look nothing like the more So I don't know how they got that. How they got that. Well, if you know the French, then you know what. And then and then historically, the French Church, the French as a society, they've they've often been quite rebellious like that. So I mean, it's a, it's a, 
um, defense, though, they held the rally. The Christians there held the rally. Yeah, uh, with their, rally. About hundreds of thousands yeah. of people. So, was a good rally. Hundreds of thousands. Yeah. So, they did a great job. So, that's fun. Yeah. On that issue? Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. That yeah. response to that. Yeah. Yes, it's a direct response to that. Yeah. 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 I remember yeah. hearing uh, the church that. Um, uh, there was a, a, a pride parade going by by this church in Colorado somewhere, and the church, you know, did not agree with that you know, whole idea. But they were out there passing out water bottles. Mm -hmm. uh, if you need water, you know, here, here just in case it's hot, you know, we want to help. The same, but we're not the ugly, uh, as you think we are. Uh, we're the church. That's beautiful. Yeah, sometimes. Yeah. And then they still wind up, you know, whatever. Okay, uh, let's move on. Uh, so through the supper, let's go to the Gethsemane prayer, uh, verse 32. It was called Gethsemane. He said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took with him Peter, James, and John, and began to stress and agitated. And he said to them, I'm deeply grieved, even to death, remain here and keep awake. So you've got these levels. They go right at the garden. They stop, and this, both of the disciples are left, but Peter, James, and John go with him. A little further, and then he stops there. And Jesus goes to verse 35 and going a little farther, he threw himself on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. He said, Abba, Father, for you all things are possible. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I want, but what you want. And he came and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not keep awake one hour? Keep awake and pray that you may not come into the time of trial. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Mm -hmm. And he goes back and finds them sleeping again uh, at another time. Uh, so uh, the, the, the thought that I saw then is, is like Jesus knows who's <laughs> there's just levels. Some of us are, are new babes in Christ. Some of us are uh, deeper following of the Lord. Uh, and even those of us who are that close to the Lord still fall asleep on him. Yeah, and still make our mistakes. Uh, so it's still it's still an issue. And then his prayer. For you all things are possible. Remove this cup from me. Yeah. Nevertheless, that's not what I want, yeah. but what you want. Mm -hmm. Now that right there, well, that right there, I see I do the carrying cross and burdens. Of the world right there, right now, just seen it. And that's when he fell down, like, Lord, like it was just like he's telling us to do. Yeah. Right then and there, like he was saying, speak. Yeah. Right then and there. He just, like, uh, help me, Father. Mm -hmm. Help me, Lord. And the willingness to say, your will, not mine. <laughs> All right, we're going to probably stop there. <laughs> Uh, and there's a whole lot more to come, and you're going to go ahead and read uh, on your own. Uh, but the death of Jesus, the words that he's given, uh, that he says on the cross, Simon of Cyrene is in here uh, in, in verse 21, uh, the father of Alexander and Rufus. Uh, and that's uh, an allusion to how widespread the gospel was going to go, that Simon was going to go back to Cyrene, which is a northern uh, modern day Libya. Uh, so there's an African uh, transmission of the gospel there. For anybody who wants to say that Africans didn't have the gospel until slavery came, wrong. Uh, right? Even the Book of Acts is about the same thing uh, with the Ethiopian uh, thing. So there, there's so many things that to pull out of the crucifixion and resurrection of the Lord. You're going to go just to the end of chapter 16. Now, uh, we've talked before about ancient manuscripts and how they, uh, when you, when you, they, they would find, when King James was written, the manuscripts they were working with were probably written, uh, copied four or five hundred years after the time of Christ. Uh, and then they find other manuscripts that are closer to the time of Christ. And that's where you get uh, longer endings, shorter endings uh, that we have. So, the oldest manuscripts have a shorter ending of Mark. In fact, it ends at verse 8 after the resurrection. Uh, it says that, so they went out and fled from the tomb for terror and amazement and seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. So that's where it ended in the old manuscripts that they found. 
Other manuscripts that they found that were a little more recent uh, toward us, not that one, which is more recent, uh, they add the rest of the stories, uh, including the appearance uh, to the two disciples, and then, of course, this great commission. And that's what I really want to go to now is the 15th verse, uh, which is the version of Acts 1 8. He says, And he said to them, Go into all the world and proclaim the good news to the whole creation. The one who believes and is baptized will be saved, but the one who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. By using my name, they will cast out demons, they will speak in their tongues, they will pick up snakes in their hands. If they drink any deadly thing, it will not hurt them. They will lay their hands on the sick and they will recover. Right? Uh, so these are the signs that follow those who believe. But the key charge, though, like Acts 1 8, is go into all the world to proclaim the good news to the whole creation. In Acts 1 8, he gives you the empowerment of the Holy Spirit to go do it. Right? But that's still the goal is proclaiming the good news to all the creation. Uh, those who believe and those who do not believe, they're not all going to believe. That's, that's a key thought, even as we discuss the, the France stuff. Uh, not everybody's going to believe you. They're not all going to treat us right. So. Okay. All right, let's stop there. Where are we going next week, Rach? Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes. <laughs> 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 chapters one through five, right? Uh, and let's set aside chapter three, uh, verses one through. Uh, I want to say, I better not say that. So, uh, you know what I'm guessing on things like this. Uh, 1 through 15. All right, that'll be on scripture. Who wants to read for next week? Are you doing such a great job? You should do it again next week. It was like 10 years. <laughs> I'm trying to encourage her. I'm just trying to encourage you. Yeah. Rachel's got it. All right, Rachel's got it. Rachel, we'll read our reader next week. Uh, chapter 3, verse 1 to 15. Okay? And we're reading what? Keep reading your Bibles. Keep reading the Word. All right? Finish it off, Mark. Read the whole thing through. Uh, if you have some comments on Mark and you want to read on next week, we can do that as well. Uh, to start off. Uh, the, what you saw in the crucifixion and resurrection stories, uh, they can be very, very cool stuff. All right. So let's do that. And then we'll see you next week, next Wednesday at 6 30. Do we have any, uh, should Shonda? Do we have any dinner plans next week? No, we do not. Me and First Lady is going to talk, discuss that, and we'll give everyone a call. That's good. Yeah, we'll give y'all a call. All right. They have some bananas in there that people can take. Yeah. Bananas, watermelon, yeah. watermelon, yeah. lots of desserts to go. Yeah. All right. I couldn't finish my hopes. All right. Just stand and we'll pray. Let's pray today. Father, we thank you for this discussion you allowed us to have. We thank you for the scriptures, Lord, that continually speak to us and challenge us. Uh, praying, Father, for faith uh, that we might trust and believe your word and, and put it into action. Uh, speak your word into situations. Uh, we're praying, Father, for uh, the, the warning that you've given to us, that we will be prepared and we will be ready, uh, that we will be prepared for a, a defense of the gospel of Jesus Christ, Lord, uh, that we will never lose sight of the charge that you've given to us to go and make disciples of all the creation. So bless us, Lord, with a commitment to that. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right, God bless y'all.